All right, good morning and happy Lord's Day. Good to see you out this morning. Let's stand one more time, please, as we consider our text reading this morning, which is going to be from Paul's epistle to the Romans, the saints in Rome. <clears throat> We're going to consider Romans chapter 1, verse 1 down through verse 7 this morning. Romans chapter 1, Paul writes here, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we receive grace and, ap and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ, to all who be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God, the, God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne once again this day with thankful and full hearts for your many blessings that you give to us. Lord, we thank you for this time we have to gather here this morning to worship you and to look into your word. We ask your blessings on us now, Lord, that your spirit would move freely among us, convicting our hearts, drawing us close to you, edifying this church as only you can. Lord, we pray that you would give us confidence and grace as we strive to serve you, help us to overcome the things of this world. Forgive us of our sins, Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> so this morning, and actually today, we are going to be considering, for the most part, one of the greatest men, I think, of all time, certainly in the scriptures, and that is the Apostle Paul. And the reason for that is we're going to start doing um, a series of studies through the book of Romans. And I think it would be good for us to have a really good understanding of who the author is and in understanding who he is, um, his background and everything that goes into him and his character. It will help us to understand why he wrote this book and the manner in which he wrote it and the purpose of it. So this morning, I actually, um, I have my outline, the verses that I wanted to use for today. We're going to consider this not only this morning, but then also this afternoon. And I was going to kind of do an introduction as far as just his background, his character, and that sort of thing this morning, and then get into his conversion this afternoon. But I flipped that. We're going to talk strictly about his conversion this morning, his testimony of salvation. I love testimonies. And I don't think there is a more powerful testimony than Paul uh, in the Holy Scriptures. And then this afternoon, we'll go back and kind of look at his background, where he comes from, all the things that go into the making of this great man. But I want to consider um, his, his conversion, first of all. Everybody's testimony, everybody's story has a, a starting point. Certainly, from the time you were born, God's desire is that you would be saved and come to a full understanding of the truth. For most, that never happens for a variety of reasons. Um, that's certainly not God's desire. Things are in motion right now. The world is heavily populated, and unfortunately, most do not understand the gospel. Most don't even care about the gospel. So it, it just kind of... with. Um, as population grows, more and more are growing without the knowledge of God or Jesus Christ as their Savior. So they have no testimony. Um, and the Bible is full of personal testimonies, people who come to a place of faith in Christ, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, I believe I'm looking at a group of people here, as far as I know, and I know most of, I know every one of your testimonies. You all have testimonies of salvation. Since we are putting this on, YouTube as a means of ministry, there may be somebody who listens in who does not have a testimony of salvation. So it's, you're still a work in progress. God is looking to draw you to him in the same way that he drew Paul in this fashion. Paul's a unique character. I don't think there, to try to compare our testimony of salvation with his, I think is a, a big mistake. And we'll see why, because it is, it is dramatic, his conversion. And while I think every testimony of salvation and conversion is dramatic, it has different levels. 
of, of how God reveals himself to you. Paul was certainly chosen for a lot of reasons to be who he was. And just like us, we are chosen as part of God's overall purpose and plan for what we can do and what God can use us for. So I want to start with um, what I think is the beginning of his testimony. Um, so I know a lot of you know his background. You know where he came from. We're going to look at that this afternoon um, in a little bit more detail. But his testimony has a starting point. And we don't know really much about Saul as far as his involvement with Christ. In other words, I don't think that he knew Jesus personally. I think a lot of his contemporaries probably did. There is no record of Paul or Saul at the time um, ever having any physical contact with Jesus Christ, ever hearing him speak or anything like that. He may have. I just don't know. There's no record of it in the scriptures. So the beginning of his, his conversion actually starts in a message preached by a deacon of the church in chapter 6 of Acts. So go back there to, to the book of Acts, if you would. I'm glad I caught myself because I turned to the book of Romans chapter 6. And that wouldn't make any sense to you. So in Acts chapter 6, the church, which is really not all that old right now, it's fairly new, uh, still in its infancy, they, they have fallen under heavy persecution by those that hated Christ. That, that hatred for him carried over into the early church to where there was heavy persecution upon these early saints. And at this particular point, it seems that Paul, forgive me for going back and forth with his name, he is at this point Saul of Tarsus, um, but Saul kind of now gets involved. And it seems like in his up to this point, he was kind of kind of coming up in the ranks as far as a Pharisee and a leader among the Jewish people. I don't know how old he is at this point, um, but he seems to be young enough to where he's still learning, but old enough to where he's starting to gain some respect. And here in this particular situation, this scene, Stephen, who is one of the deacons of the church, is called upon to preach really the message of his life. You know, we, we had a conversation a while back on you know, who are the preachers in the church? Well, every one of us technically is a preacher. We have a message that we deliver. Um, some are called to different things, but everyone, every member of the church is in essence a preacher. We have a message. We are telling about Christ and his saving grace. Um, I'm going to start in verse 9 in chapter 6. And we see here the heavy persecution that is already <clears throat> heavy upon the church. In chapter nine, verse chapter six, verse nine, rather, it says, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. Um, or I think um, the, the freedmen or freed slaves is what they were. Seems to be a group of people who at one time were slaves, physical slaves, that had obtained their freedom, and they had this, this synagogue. They were Jews. Um, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, of them, of Cilicia and Asia, um, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit with which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous things against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders of the scribes, and they came to him and caught him and brought him into the council. The wording there shows that he may have been trying to get away to um, not become apprehended, but they happened to actually catch him, and they called him before a council of people. And notice what they did, this council. It's very familiar because not long before this, when they actually apprehended Jesus, they actually did the same thing. It says they, um, verse 13, it says they set up false witnesses, which said this man ceases, ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Speaking of the temple, Jerusalem, the law of God, they, they counted him as speaking blasphemous things. All they had, they had no evidence. It was only their opinion in how they saw the word of God. And in reality, it wasn't blasphemous at all in what he was saying. Then they say in verse 14, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place 
and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. And Stephen had no such thing in his heart. None of the early apostles or disciples ever said such a thing. They were not going to change the law of Moses. Unlike, I think we talked uh, earlier about uh, what's happening apparently on Mount Sinai right now, where there's a gathering of religious leaders who are going to come up with a set of a new set of Ten Commandments. We'll set that aside for a moment, though. Um, but they accused him of changing the customs which Moses delivered. And the, the church was not a change of customs at all. It was really just a continuation under a new covenant. There were some things that were fulfilled in the law, of course. Um, but there were some things that still continue on, which God commanded uh, with Moses. And we still practice those things today. And in verse 15, it says, All that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, and notice this. It says they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I don't know what that means. But they, they saw him in a different light. Something was going on here. Now, I don't know. When I was um, first going to church, and I think this is especially true as I began to fall under conviction, when the pastor was preaching the word of God, uh, and I got more under conviction, I'm thinking especially the day that I was saved. I can remember very vividly looking at the pastor, Brother Rick Howard at the time, and seeing him almost in a different way. I was heavy under conviction um, with myself being lost in sin, the fact that I knew I wasn't right with God. And the whole message, I was intent on everything that he said. And of course, Rick Howard is no angel. Well, he's a messenger of God, of course, but um, he's not an angelic being. But I saw him. Um, in a way that really kind of changed me. Something's going on here where these men, and it's going to include Saul, as we're going to see in a moment, um, that they saw him in a different way. And we go into chapter 7, it says, Then the high priest said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren, fathers, hearken, the God of glory um, appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Iran. And he said unto him, "Get then." I'm not going to read the whole story here, okay? But he basically recounts the story of the Old Testament as Peter had done before. And it was very convicting because what they're doing in telling the story that starts in Genesis continues with uh, going through Abraham and then Moses and the law and all of that. Ultimately, it all leads to Christ. And that's exactly what they do. They bring it all to Jesus, whom just not that long before this point, they looked at as a false messiah and they crucified him. And yet Stephen is here preaching him that he is the messiah. So I'm going to go down to verse, uh, let's see where I want to pick up. In, down towards the end of all of this, let's go into verse 51. <clears throat> so this is the end of his message. It's actually pretty detailed. If you want to get a a good understanding of the Old Testament kind of in a nutshell. Um, this is a great message to do. He talks about a lot of things. And then he ultimately brings it to uh, faith in Christ and actually accuses them, as others have, of being the murderers of Christ. And then in verse 51, he says this. Now, I've never done this as I close out a message. <laughs> Look at the audience and, you know, accuse anybody of being stiff-necked and mm -hmm uncircumcised and hardened ears although that may be the reality some people when they hear the word of God they become they get tense and they shut off they don't want to hear the truth and they become rebellious so he actually they were getting angry and I think he was able to see their anger and I pointed this out before I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this but I want to point this out is that even though he's been arrested he's in the middle of a sort of a a religious mob scene here Stephen is in full control and he knows it he's the one that has the control not them and I think he knows in the back of his mind the seriousness of the situation that as things if things continue to go bad he's probably going to give up his life and I've said this before also that I don't know the, the, the whole scene here if anybody else from the church was able to witness this I think there may have been a few, but I don't think everybody was. But I could imagine those that had heard that Stephen got arrested. He's standing before this council. 
I can imagine the church calling a very impromptu prayer service. One of our own is now in a situation where he needs our prayers. And I can, that doesn't say this, I'm just imagining it, that the church came together in prayer for Stephen. Now, I, I also think that ultimately their prayer was for God's will to be done. Of course, they didn't know what God's will was at this point. We do because we read the story here. We see what happens. I think in their minds, they wanted for God to deliver Stephen. He may have had a family, at least brothers and sisters, a mother and father, maybe a wife and children, and that he was in a situation here where they knew how serious it was. These men, these religious leaders were filled with hate and they, they were capable of doing the most horrendous things as many of them witnessed when they killed Christ. So he says, you, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers? He's accusing them of murder. And they don't take that lightly. He says, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it? When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. I think there's a mixture of emotion, emotions here. One, Stephen just called them murderers. So they're angry about that. But then the truth that he is speaking, I think also kind of mixed with their anger, produced a conviction that not knowing how to deal with it, they didn't want to necessarily say, okay, he's right, and repent and put their faith in Christ. That, that would prove them to be liars and frauds. Well, I think there were some that actually did that, maybe not in this setting, but there's one verse, I think we'll probably read it this afternoon, where there were a lot of the religious leaders that did put their faith in Christ, so many priests um, who at one time hated him and were part of that mob crying for him to be crucified, um, they did repent and put their faith in Christ. So it's not unheard of. So I think this, this emotion is a mixture of spiritual things and just uh, human emotion, anger at what is being said. Nobody likes to be challenged with their faith, especially when they believe it's right. You know, again, just to kind of go back for a moment to my, my conversion, leading up to it, uh, I was really challenged with what I believed religiously growing up. I did not want to admit that it was wrong. And in my thinking, and I remember thinking this very vividly as well, that if, if the way that I was raised, which was Catholic, Roman Catholic, if it was wrong, then that not only means that I'm lost because I never had a testimony of salvation, but I'm thinking that there's a very good chance that those of my family that have passed on may not have been saved. I didn't know. I never heard of this before. I'm sure that there were some that, that were saved. I don't, I don't know, though. Um, so I didn't know. And I, it, it, it stirred up a little bit of emotion to the point of, in fact, I said this to somebody who was challenging me on what I believed, it, comparing the Roman Catholic Church and all of its glory to the Baptist churches and all of their <laughs> poverty. <laughs> They're non-glory. My question was this, how can that be wrong? And I really believed it because they were so large and had so much money and such beautiful dynamics about their, their religious system. How can that possibly be wrong? And boy, have I changed my mind since then. Most things that look glorious in this world probably are wrong because it's all about the outward appearance. But nonetheless, these people are being challenged and it's it's hurtful. They're thinking about, I'm sure the same things I thought about. What about our forefathers? Where did they stand in all of this? But Stephen in verse 55, it says, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and I love this, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I wonder, and I don't know this, I didn't really, I just thought about this actually, reading it in this way. The word and there almost separates these two thoughts, the glory of God and then Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I think Jesus Christ is the glory of God. So it, it could be translated maybe even 
rather than and, which connects the two, and and may not really separate it all that much, but in any case, the glory of God, he saw the glory of God in Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Wouldn't you love to see that? Oh my goodness, I, I, I can't even describe what he saw. He doesn't give us a full description here. But it says in verse 57, or verse 56 rather, as he says this, he says, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, in previous verses, we're, we're told that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, that he went to heaven. Brother Rene talked about that, didn't quite get to that point. We still have him, I think, in our Sunday school class, kind of somewhere between earth and heaven. We didn't right, actually get him to that point. <laughs> but it says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Why then does it picture the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the glory of God, standing at the right hand? Many have speculated, and I can't dispute this, I kind of think it is the case, that as he oversees his churches, or in this case, his church at this time, this is the only body of Christ on the planet at this point. As Jesus, who is the head of the church, is witnessing what is going on in this earthly place, and one of his saints taking a firm stand, he's standing. Um, apparently, as this unfolds, waiting to welcome Stephen into heaven. So Stephen's kind of stuck here in these two places. Um, he knows that this is getting very serious. And by the way, I mentioned that he is in full control here. He had the control to put this to a stop. I believe that. That if he would have changed anything about what he said, kind of softened up a little bit, maybe sugarcoated it some things so it wouldn't get these people all stirred up, he probably could have saved his life. But we're also told that he was full of the Holy Ghost. He wasn't just full of his human emotions. And, he, and I, think, I think as time goes on and the Lord's church is, gets closer to the return of Christ and we know the world is going to get more crazy than it is now, we may face situations like this. Maybe not exactly like this, but like this. To where we are going to be called upon to take a stand for what we believe in the midst of religious chaos. Because we don't always believe with a lot of the things that are said religiously in the world. In fact, some of the things we believe and take a stand on are quite different than the rest of the religious world, even the Christian community. And it's not easy to take a stand against somebody who is who really doesn't know what they're talking about. And these guys didn't know what they were talking about, clearly, these Jews who accused Stephen of of committing, committing blasphemy. Obviously, they didn't get it, but they were very confident in their what they were saying. And there's religious people who are very confident in what they say, but they're wrong in what they say. So God's people are, are going to have to, as always, rely upon the Holy Spirit to get us through moments like this. If, I, if, you, if you've been serving God for any length of time, and you've been in situations of witnessing to somebody, you probably experienced the Holy Ghost's help, the Holy Spirit's help. And sometimes, all the time, it's not us. It's the Holy Spirit that works through us. So when he said, behold, I see heavens opened, I love that, just thinking about that. There's a number of places where that phrase is found in the scriptures, heaven opened. Heaven standing open. And some men in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, Isaiah, um, others have seen heaven open. And they've seen the glory of God behind that veil that prohibits us from seeing into the heavens. Anyway, Stephen, he's able to see into the heavens at this point. He describes what he sees. In verse 57, they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears. This is humorous put their fingers in their ears and la, 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 I don't want to hear what you're saying, that kind of thing, stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him with the witnesses and the witnesses laid down their clothes. This is the first place this man's name is found in the scriptures. But laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man whose name was Saul. 
and they stoned Stephen. Calling upon God, Stephen was calling upon God, and saying, Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So if the scene I described earlier where the saints were gathered outside, not being able to see what's going on, they're praying for God to deliver Stephen. Lord, help him. Be with him. We need him. He's a powerful part of this church. We need him here. Did God not hear their prayer? Or did he hear their prayer? And we know that God doesn't always see things the way we do. We're very limited in our sight. Sometimes we don't, we don't think past the immediate moment, what's going on right now, where God's foresight is all-knowing. And I think God knows, I, I say I think, I know with 100% accuracy that God knew that the gospel was better with Stephen giving his life at this point and being replaced technically with somebody else who's able to get the gospel in a much broader sense. And we see that happening here. They don't know that. We do. We see the big picture. They didn't. So Stephen calling upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Lord, you have to love this because this is almost exactly what the Lord said when he was dying. Lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. I spoke about that not too long ago, where the saints are pictured as simply falling asleep, passing from one reality to the next reality. Stephen is a, in a far better place from this point forward. But this isn't the end of the story. And the story actually is far reaching at this point. Seems like the end, but it's really just the beginning. Not only was this um, the end of Stephen necessarily, and no doubt there was a time of great mourning among the church and his family, his loved ones, but coming to grips with the fact that what we're involved in is very serious here. And they're challenged with, do we really believe this or do we not? And the persecution becomes even more heavy from this point forward. Because in chapter 8, which we'll just look at very briefly for a moment here before we actually get to Paul's actual conversion in chapter 9, um, the conversion is so intense, seemingly at the leadership of Saul, so intense upon the church that they're now scattered throughout the world. They're, they go back to all the places that they came from, Rome and uh, Samaria and Syria and all the places where they came from, these Jews were had mixed backgrounds. So they went back to where they came from. Was that all part of God's design? I would have to say absolutely. And if we, even if we think about what Jesus told the church, even in, back in chapter 1, let's look at this for a moment. Brother Nate talked about this uh, maybe last week, actually. Uh, where did he, did he get to it yet? Uh, let me see. Yeah, verse 8. I think got to it last week. So verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He's speaking to the church. And you shall be witnesses unto me in both Judea, excuse me, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, all through the next few chapters, even up until chapter 6, they were staying right there in Jerusalem. And they were very prejudiced. They were only preaching to the Jews, where the commandment of God was to go into all of the world and preach the gospel. Well, they weren't doing it. So God had to kind of give them a little nudge. Okay, a big nudge. Persecution came upon the church. They lost loved ones. And I think it gave them really a sense of urgency and seriousness about what they are called to do. I think that without being accusative, accusing anybody, any church of anything, maybe not even us, but I think sometimes the church needs a little nudge to realize how serious what we are um, involved in. It's a very serious thing. And it's not just about the comforts of this life or the comforts of this world as we know it. So Stephen's gone. Chapter 8, verse 1 says... And Saul, second place his name is found, was consenting unto his death. Seemingly, he gave the okay. 
They said they laid their, their coats down at the feet of a young man named Saul. We're going to look at his background up to this point this afternoon. But he gave the okay to kill Stephen. Perhaps, hesitantly, he heard some things that challenged him. I don't think he heard these things before. Not in this way. Not in this powerful of a way with the Holy Spirit kind of overseeing the whole thing. No doubt he heard about Christ. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. That's why he hated these people. Because all he knew was what his brethren were telling him that they heard. And he believed their lies rather than investigating things for himself. Now he hears this testimony from a man named Stephen. And I believe it's convicting to him. I believe it's soul changing for Saul. I, I don't know. We're going to look at his conversion in just a moment in chapter 9, like I said. But I don't know if that's exactly the point when he was saved or not. I do think that sometime between what happens here and then what happens on the road to Damascus is when he was saved. Maybe it was that point. I'll tell you this, we'll get this this afternoon also. Whenever he gives his testimony, he goes right back to chapter 9 and the events that happened there. When I get my testimony, I go right back to what I found out to be September 11th <laughs> rather than 12th. 1983, I go right back to that point. I don't go back to the convicting part and you know all the things I struggled with up to that point. I go back to that moment that I was saved. And that's what Paul did. So uh, I don't know for sure, but it says Paul, Saul rather was consenting into his death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. It says, devout man carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and um, hailing or hauling men and women, committing, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, sharing their testimony, sharing the things they witnessed, not only about the life of Christ, but even these recent things. They took the story with them. And the apostles says, stay behind. And I think what happens just to maybe kind of tie some things together is these people scattered over the course of the next months and years. The apostles went to these places where they scattered, got these, um, these disciples together and organized churches. Okay. They didn't leave, you know, with, um, this wasn't like a mission effort where they're sent out. They left abruptly with just their testimonies and their, um, their testimony and their salvation. Acts chapter 9. One of the most powerful portions of Scripture. We're just going to read. Um, I'm not quite sure how far down, but let's start. The rest of chapter 8 deals with other things concerning the church. And then chapter 9 picks up with... Um, Saul's conversion, and basically from this point forward, except for chapter 10, really focuses on Paul, Saul, his ministry, his apostleship, his writings. He wrote at least 13, possibly 14 epistles in the New Testament. I'm not going to tell you how many times his name is mentioned in just in the book of Acts alone. I'll tell you that this afternoon. But he becomes a prominent figure from this point forward in the Holy Scriptures. He was an important guy. God knew what he was doing in calling Saul to this. But here in verse 1 of chapter 9, it says, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. He was an angry man. When I, when I read verses like that, or, or statements like that, I kind of picture a, um, a bull going like this with its hoofs, with uh, steam and red eyes, steam coming out of his nostrils, just kind of waiting to attack. He's not wasn't a friendly guy. He did a lot of harm. He killed a lot of people, put a lot of women. He, apparently he was merciless. He was one of these guys, I think, in comparison, that would take a man's family, bring him out and say, unless you recant of your faith in Christ, I'm gonna execute your family. He was a zealot. He was crazy. Um, 
And he thought he was doing the Lord's will. So at this point, he's still breathing out threats against these disciples. But there's something different. He had heard the message in a powerful way, and the seed was planted in his heart. Not just his mind, in his heart. And clearly, it begins to take root. In verse 2, he desired of him letters to Damascus, uh, to the synagogues, that if he found any who were of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. Now, when I was saved, I didn't see any light from heaven shining around about me. And I've spoken with those that were there the day that I was saved, and they didn't see anything either. They didn't hear the Lord speaking to me, but he was. This is a very powerful event. So it says he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you persecuting me? Well, who is being persecuted here? The saints of the Lord. The Lord's church, the body of Christ, was being persecuted. And that the Lord speaks from heaven and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why would he take it so personal? Well, we know why. I mean, we're his body, we're his bride. He takes it personal. When somebody persecutes us, it's as if they're persecuting the Lord himself. In fact, we should look at it that way, even among our brethren. When our own brethren are being attacked, we should look at it as we're being attacked. When our brethren rejoice, we rejoice with them. It's a, it's a very close-knit unit that we are part of, with a connection to heaven. So Saul says in verse 5, Who are you? He says, Lord. Who are you, Lord? He knew this was God talking to him. And I think the next thing that we read here must have been shocking to him to have God who, who I believe he knew God as Jehovah I believe he knew him okay as far as a saving way I don't I don't know that there does come a point we got into a little bit this morning where there, there was a point to where the Jews had to not only believe in God have their faith in Jehovah but they had to understand that Jesus is that Jehovah. And many of them didn't understand that. They didn't make that connection. So where, where Saul's at at this point in all of that is a little bit fuzzy, but I think this was kind of shocking to him. When Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And then he says this, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or goads. I've explained this before. I'm going to, I want to explain it again. But he's using a phrase here that was pretty common among this area when they would, uh, the people would break in what essentially were beasts of burden. I'm thinking an ox, for example. If you get a wild ox, um, you have to train it or break it from its wild nature. And any wild animal you do, uh, you have to kind of break its will so that you can have control over it. So these, what they would do with these oxes in order to get them to plow the fields properly without you know, going all crazy, without getting lions that look like that, they wanted them to go straight and listen to what their master is saying. They would have to break them. So they would harness these oxen, oftentimes initially to a, a post that is um, fixed in the ground. And they would have a, 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 a board or maybe a rope, and the, the ox would go around the, the post bucking and kicking, trying to get away from the harness. And every once in a while, the, the master would prod it or stick it with a, a stick that has pricks or goads on it, and it would hurt. So every time this animal would buck and kick, it would get a jab in the rear, and it would keep doing this until finally its will is broken, and then it would surrender itself. So we kind of get the impression here that Paul, by comparison, was kind of wild by nature, he had, to, he had a strong will. He did not want to immediately surrender. And the Lord had to keep prodding him, keep pricking him. We feel that. When the Lord convicts us, that's the Lord prodding us or convicting us, pricking us in our hearts. We read a verse where 
Uh, it said that those ones that were listening to Stephen, they were pricked in their heart. Now Saul is feeling this here in a very powerful way. And the Lord says unto him, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Now Saul, something happens at this point to where his will is broken. Now I've seen, I've never been, well, I'm a city boy. <laughs> I've never been much outside of the city. So I don't know the reality of breaking an animal and getting it to submit uh, to a will. But I've seen movies. I've watched TV enough to see these kind of things. Um, and it's pretty dramatic. When an animal's will is broken, it is now completely surrendered. You could do that with pets. You know, you have to kind of break them in as well. But it's completely, its character is changed to where it now realizes that it is not the master. Somebody has control over it. And this is Saul. He, verse 6, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? He has completely surrendered to the will of God. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and you shall be told there what you must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. We're going to look at his testimony as he recounts this later on. And there's some variations, as, as there are oftentimes in the scriptures, not discrepancies, but variations in the description of what happened. One, one verse says that they heard thunderings. Something was going on, and they knew it, but they didn't know exactly what. But Saul knew what was going on. I know I've said this before, but from, from my perspective, one of the most amazing things about the, preaching the gospel is when you can see the gospel begin to take effect in somebody. It, it's such a powerful thing. You, you don't see the hand of God or the Spirit of God physically coming down and convicting somebody. But you see the manifestation of it. You see the, the conviction plays itself out in emotions, in, in behavior. You can see it. And you can see struggle. People squirming in their seats. I've seen people, um, because of conviction, get up and walk out because they don't like the conviction. It's uncomfortable. And then I've also seen times where you can see somebody struggling and then all of a sudden they just surrender. It's just like this big relief just comes over them. Especially when somebody comes down to the altar and just trembling like Saul was here, just shaking because they know that they're lost. And then when they finally surrender, there's just this huge relief. We call that our testimony. What's, what's interesting about testimonies is that I guess I could compare them to snowflakes where everyone is different, but essentially the, the end result is always the same. A snowflake, if you look at it under a microscope, it, everyone is different, but it's still H2O in some fashion. And if you hear somebody's testimony, there's all these different stories and backgrounds that come into it, but the end result is a sinner has been saved, past tense. That's a game changer. I think, unfortunately, the gospel in much of Christianity today has been so watered down that not only is the change not dramatic, but sometimes there is no change. There's a phrase that I, I like it. I don't know who coined it, but it's called easy believism. Easy believism. Just call upon Jesus, invite him into your heart, and you're saved. And that may or may not be true. If somebody's not under conviction and they don't really know what they're doing and they say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. If there's no conviction involved and no faith involved, then nothing has happened. And to tell that person that they've been saved without really um, trying to find out what happened to get them to that point, I think is a mistake on whoever is trying to lead that person to Christ. Sadly, I think a lot of times it's more of a case of trying to get numbers, another notch in the belt of a, a number, a professed faith in Christ without really being concerned about that person and what really happened. We want to know if a person has genuinely been saved because a person who has genuinely been saved knows it. They have a testimony like this, maybe not this dramatic, maybe no lights or voices from heaven, but there's a point in time where they have put their faith in Christ and they were saved. Like I said, there's a lot about this that so much involved, but something happened here to Saul. Most people, 
from the, the, the very moment that they're saved, their life isn't immediately converted. Sometimes there's a growing process. A lot of people have a, a true conversion testimony after they put their faith in Christ. Sometimes that's called, um, wow, I can't think of the word. Uh, I got myself out on this limb. Um, not repentance. Uh, you place your raise, I'll try and sound it out. Or, um, ah, hmm? Recommitment, that sort of thing. Committing yourself. But being saved doesn't mean you automatically surrender yourself to Christ. It means you've been born again. You still have to surrender yourself to Christ. And that doesn't always come immediately. We see something happen with Saul here that he was immediately committed. And the rest of the story, which we'll continue with this afternoon, we see that this was genuine. There, there's no smoke and mirrors about this. This is, this is different. Something has happened to this man. I'll finish up by reading verses 8 and 9. Saul rose from the earth. When his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. He was blinded. And read the story later on. We, there were scales covering his eyes. Something had happened to him. And it seems like it affected him the rest of his life. This poor eyesight. But he was there three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. So I'll conclude this message by asking this. Mainly for the benefit of those that might be watching on YouTube. Because I know all of you, I've heard, I hear your testimony a lot. We talk about these things a lot. So I'll ask those that are watching on YouTube, do you have this definitive moment where you have repented and put your faith in Christ? At the preaching of the gospel, it's not just a matter of going to church. It's not just a matter of turning over a new leaf. It's not just a matter of giving things up and trying to be a better person. It's a matter of God convicting you by the preaching of the word and you putting your faith in him. It's personal. That's why we call it a personal testimony of salvation. There is now a personal relationship of you with your creator, which before that point, there was no personal relationship. It was God and you being you trying to avoid answering to God. And people do that by nature. But the preaching of the word is powerful. Now, keep this in the back of your mind. And I know all of you will that are here because all of this goes into Almost everything Paul says in writing the book of Romans, it all falls into place in, a, I think, a very powerful way, which is why I wanted to kind of focus initially on him as the author of that book before we actually dig into the book. We're going to stand at this time and have a song of invitation as we close out the service. There might be a need even here this morning of somebody needing to call upon the Lord for whatever reason. I don't know what the reason might be, but... Whatever the case is, we know we can go to him. God's very powerful. He often convicts us in ways that we might not even imagine. If you're listening to this on the media of YouTube, you've never put your faith in Christ as your Savior and something tells you that you need to do so, that's God, not me. I can't tell you that. Put your faith in Christ before it's everlastingly too late. What page, brother? 17. for your attention this morning. I hope that each one received a blessing by the services today. I think um, the Lord's Church for the past, I don't know, a couple of hundred years or so has had a habit of singing an invitation, which I think is fine. I have no problem with that. I think it's a good thing. Closing out uh, a message with an invitation to trust in Christ, I, I have no problem with that. We don't see that in the New Testament. We see the preaching going out with power and conviction and people asking, what, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to be saved? Sadly, in my 30 plus years of preaching, I've never heard that um, while I'm preaching. I'd love to hear that though. Mm -hmm. Somebody come down, it, it's happened in the past, I know that. 
uh, during revival times, men or women or even children sometimes at the age of accountability, so convicted they step out during a message and go down to the altar to be saved. Testimonies are powerful. They're wonderful. Again, thank you for your attention. Um, we're going to meet back at 2 o'clock and con continue this, kind of with more of a background of Saul, what makes Saul tick, who he was, what are his credentials, why did God choose him for this in this way. Anything on your hearts before we dismiss? If not, all hearts are clear. Sister Valerie, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for your wonderful grace and your mercy, Lord, and, and for the message that was brought and as we meditate on, on uh, Paul's conversion, Lord, and his testimony, we meditate on our own testimony, Father, we just thank you for this and, and allowing us to have this truth and this salvation, Father, for, of everlasting life, Father, and we just pray for those, our, our loved ones, our friends, our family that, that don't have this, Lord, and, and open their hearts and their minds to your word before it's too late, Lord, and, and give us the words and the, the, the wisdom to talk to them about um, you, Lord, and and just um, we pray that for uh, more opportunities to tell others, um, those that we meet about you, Father, and Father, forgive us where we fail you, and we ask that you bless the our lunch and the second service um, that's about to take place, Father, and we ask that you please come back soon. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.